Penny from Heaven by Jennifer L. Holm. Chapter 10, The Water Boy's Treasure. Frankie thinks it's hilarious. Your mother's dating Milky Mulligan, he goffs. We're sweeping up the store. It's me and Frankie's job to put down new sawdust. Otherwise, the blood from the back gets tracked everywhere. Does he smell like old cheese? Frankie asks. You should, you know, how milk bottles sometimes get that old cheese smell when they're left out in the sun? Frankie, I say. Boy, if they get married, you'll be Penny Milky Mulligan. Shut up, he bursts out laughing. You can serve milk instead of champagne at the wedding. No, wait, I got it. Milkshakes. Knock it off, I say, and wave my broom at him threateningly. Hey, he protests, I'm just fooling. It's not funny. He snickers. You think maybe you can get me a Dale and Cottage cheese? The bell on the door rings and Uncle Sally walks in, which is a good thing because I am a step away from whacking Frankie right in the kisser. Not that it would do any good. Hey, kids, Uncle Sally says and ruffles Frankie's hair, even though he's barely an inch taller than Frankie. How's your mother, Penny? Uncle Sally asks. I want to say she's wrecking my life, but instead I say, she's good, thanks. A great lady, your mother, he says wistfully. Uncle Sally has a crush on my mother, and he's always asking after her. I don't have the heart to tell him he's not a type. Not that I can see her dating Mr. Mulligan either, but at least he comes up to her chin. You got in any of that tongue I like, Uncle Sally asks, Uncle Ralphie. In the locker, Dominic's been saving some for you. Uncle Ralphie says, leading him into the back room. I turn to Frankie and make a gagging sound. I don't know how you can eat a tongue, even if it is from a cow. What is it with him and the tongue, I ask. Frankie shrugs and says, maybe it's because he's such a big talker. Uncle Sally always knows what's going on in town. If someone sneezes, he knows about it. Outside, a sister of mercy on the teach one of the teachers at Frankie's school walks past the window. The sister looks in and catches sight of Frankie and narrows her eyes. Frankie shakes his head and says, Those sisters of mercy, they ain't got no mercy. We load up the sawdust into buckets and carry them around back to the garbage cans. Uncle Sally and Uncle Ralphie's voice drifts through the back door of the office, which is propped open. So I was talking to old man Garbola, Uncle Sally is saying, and boy, did he ever tell me some story. I motion Frankie over to the door. Get this, Uncle Sally says. He told me that the water boy once told him that he had a bunch of money hidden somewhere at the house. The water boy was my late grandfather, Felucci. He got his nickname because of his first job on a construction site when he came to America. It just sort of stuck. He said he buried it in the ground, Uncle Sally says. Frankie's eyes widen. Inside, Uncle Ralphie chuckles. Yeah, he tell you where? If I knew, I'd be over there with a shovel right now, Uncle Sally says, and they both laugh. This doesn't surprise me all that much. Nonnie does something similar. She pins dollar bills in the hems of drapes, squirrels them away under chair cushions. I, found, I once found five dollars under one of the Queenie's beds, all matted with dog hair. I don't know why they don't put money in banks like everyone else, but they just don't. Frankie grabs my hand and squeezes. I already know what he's thinking. He's got the shovels lined up and is figuring out where to start digging. Do you believe it, he whispers, his face flushed with excitement. I don't know, maybe. Think of all that dough. Then we don't never got to worry again. By which he means that he doesn't ever have to worry about his father losing his job again. I wrinkle my nose, but if it is true, how are we going to find it? We can't go digging up the yard. Frankie's face turns sly. Says who? So you need any yard work done, Uncle Polly? Frankie is asking. We're over at Nonnie's, sitting in the upstairs kitchen. Frankie thinks that the easiest way to find the treasure is to just work in the yard. We'll figure out where the treasure is buried and then come back at night and dig it up. Uncle Polly raises his eyebrows. You volunteering? You bet, Frankie says. Uncle Polly leans back and sips his coffee. I guess the bushes could use a prune. Sure, Frankie says eagerly. 
and there are a few sticks that need picking up. Sticks? You got it, Frankie says. And while you're at it, you can cut the grass. Frankie's smile droops a little, but he says, be glad to. Thanks, kid, Uncle Polly says and turns back to his paper. Two hours later, we're still picking up sticks in the front yard. They're all over the place. A big tree is dying and has been dropping them everywhere. We haven't even gotten to the backyard yet. I'm beat, I say to Frankie. Quit complaining, he says, but we're never going to find anything at this rate. Grandpa must have left some sort of marker or something, Frankie says. How come? Because otherwise, how could he find it? I guess he does have a point. Still, I think it's like looking for a needle in a haystack, but I don't say anything. I'm gonna get something to drink, I say, as I walk away. I hear Frankie grumble to himself. A few sticks, right, and I'll sell you a bridge to China while I'm at it. I go into the house. It's quiet except for the sound of music floating downstairs. Uncle Polly's gone to work and Nonnie's visiting her old lady friends. I help myself to a ginger ale and then wander out into the hallway. Hello, I call. Who's that? Angina calls back. It's me, Penny, I say. Come on up, doll, she says. I like Aunt Gina. She's the most interesting aunt, in my opinion. She's not afraid to say what she thinks. Also, she's the only one of the aunts who doesn't have any kids, but nobody ever talks about that. Aunt Gina is in her bedroom. It's a real fancy bedroom, done all in pink. There are pink Chanel bedspreads on her and Uncle Polly's twin beds. And her makeup table has a flouncy matching pink skirt. Her dresser is covered with fancy bottles of perfume and all sorts of jars of makeup and lipsticks, and the whole room smells like evening in Paris. She's got a record player in the corner, and it's playing Nat King Cole. I love this room. It's what I imagine a movie star's bedroom looks like. Aunt Gina standing in her slip, studying two dresses lying on the one of the beds. Which one you think, she asks me. For what, I say. She squints and takes a puff on her cigarette. Atlantic City. We're going there Friday night for our anniversary. Dinner and dancing, the works. I study the dresses. One's emerald green silk with a straight skirt and the other one is red satin with a full skirt. The red one, I say, that's a dancing dress. She nods approvingly. You got a good eye, doll. Try it on, I say. I sit back on <clears throat> the bed and watch Aunt Gina shimmy into the dress. The material clings to her curvy figure and she looks beautiful. She slips on high heels and gives a few good twirls. The skirt flies up, showing off strong, slim legs. Aunt Gina used to be a dancer with the Rockettes before she married Uncle Polly. She danced at Radio City Music Hall and met lots of famous entertainers. Come here, she says, motioning me over to her dressing table. On the stool. I sit on the pink stool with the ruffle, feeling like Cinderella meeting her fairy godmother. Aunt Gina shakes her head at the state of my hair. I know, I know, I say. She picks up a thick brush and does this and that and takes a few pins and clips from my hair behind my ears and flips it so that it falls all soft and pretty around my face. That's better, she says. You tell that grandmother of yours to stop giving up those per home to stop giving you those home perms. You try telling her, I say. She laughs and pats my curls. You're real pretty, you know that? I'm surprised the boys aren't after you already. They won't ever be after me if Pop Pop keeps chasing them off, I think. You spend too much time with that no good cousin of yours, she says. Frankie? He's good, I say. You watch him, she says. I've known boys like him. He's headed for trouble with a capital T. I look at her in the mirror and imagine her kicking her way across the stage at Radio City Music Hall. You ever miss dancing, I ask. Every day, she says. But that's life, right, doll? Why'd you quit? She gives a little laugh. Your Uncle Polly liked dating a dancer. He just didn't like the idea of having a wife who was one. Your grandmother wasn't much help either. Nani wanted you to quit dancing? You got that right, she says, pursing her lips to apply bright red lipstick. And let me tell you, what your grandmother Felucci wants, she gets. She pauses, her reflection looking back at me from the mirror. You know, your father was the only one who didn't give me a hard time about dancing. Really? Yeah, she says. 
Freddie was a good egg. I wish I could have seen you dance, I say. She smiles and whirls around. You can, doll. Turn up that record player. As Frankie picks up sticks in the yard, I sit on the bed and watch Aunt Gina give the best show any rock cat has ever given. It's so good. I swear I can hear the applause. Frankie gets all excited when I tell him about Aunt Gina and Uncle Polly going to Atlantic City. Now here it is, Frankie says. We sneak over after they leave and start digging. I think I know where it might be. There's a spot where there's a smooth stone, kind of near the bushes, like a marker, you know. It's got to be the place. I don't know, Frankie, I say. Come on, he says. Just think of all that dough. In the end, they give in. It's Frankie, after all. The night of the dig, I try to act normal. I take a bath and put on my pajamas and give Mother a hard time about wanting to stay up late until she finally sends me to bed. I wait until the house is dark and quiet, and then I slip on my clothes and sneak out the back door. It's handy having my bedroom on the first floor. Frankie's waiting for me on his bicycle behind a tree. Ready, palsy Walsy? he asks. I wrap my arms around his waist, and we pedal off down the street. Nani's house is dark and quiet when we get there. Friday is Uncle Dominic's poker night, so we don't have to worry about him. You think she's asleep? Frankie asks. House looks dark, I say. He leads me over to a row of bushes and points to a small smooth stone on the ground. See, don't that look like a marker to you? Maybe. Here, he says, handing me one of the shovels he stowed earlier today. He picks up the other one and we start digging. If mother finds out I'm not home, I'm gonna get it, I mutter. Quit worrying, he says. We're gonna be famous. I can see the headline now. Boy detective finds hidden treasure. What about me, I ask. He thinks for a moment. Maybe it could say, boy detective and trusty assistant find hidden treasure. Gee, thanks. Say, what are you going to do with your share of the loot, he asks. Buy tickets to a Dodgers game. I've never been to one. Mother says ball games aren't appropriate for young girls. I want to tell her it's not appropriate to date milkmen who talk over the play-by-play. My shovel hit something hard. I think I found it, I whisper. Move, move, Frankie commands. Using his bare hands, he digs like mad and pulls an old metal box out of the ground. We share an excited look. He opens the lid, but instead of stacks of bills, there's a pile of dirt and what looks like bones and a small skull. Is that a bone, I ask? What, Frankie says. Where's the money? There's a small disc of metal with writing on it. It's Queenie 1, I say, or maybe it's Queenie 2. I can't tell, it's too dark. Frankie snorts in disgust. You kidding me? All of a sudden, I hear barking. The Queenies are going crazy, yipping up a storm. Those dumb dogs, Frankie whispers. Maybe they're not so dumb, I whisper back. Maybe they know we're out here digging up their friends. Then I hear shouting from the back door. I call the poliza, Nani shouts. It's Nani, I whisper. Nani's standing there in her black bathrobe, waving something. It's dark, so she can't see who we are. Oh, brother, Frankie says. Where'd she get a gun? Gun? What gun? Before Frankie can say anything, there's a loud blast, and he shoves me hard and says, run. We take off into the bushes, running through Uncle Nunzio's backyard, and the next one, our hearts pounding in our chests. We run and run and run and don't stop until we're far away. My bike, Frankie gasps. It's still at the house. I'm not going back, I say, trying to catch my breath. A lot of good you are, he grates and starts walking back toward Nani's. You know what the headline's going to be tomorrow morning if Nani catches you? I call. What? Dumb boy shot by own grandmother. End of chapter 10.